Well, it's finally time. After posting however many versus battle polls where we pit characters that didn't fight or even meet in the source material of Bleach itself against one another in a fierce battle to the death, it's time to really bring this idea to life to help it make the jump to video format on the channel. I've got to be honest, it's a little bit daunting. There's so many characters of wildly varying powers, abilities and strengths in the colourful world of Bleach after all, that saying this is a broad affair is a bit of an understatement. As we move through this series, there's a lot to consider here. Do we include the light novels as a frame of reference, or do we keep it strictly to what we get to see within the pages of Bleach itself? Now, to be fair, we've kind of attempted a couple of videos like this before on the channel, both when we looked at a potential battle between Aizen and the Zero Division, and Aizen and Yamamoto back in the fake Karakura Town. There seems to be a bit of a running theme there and both times they were a lot of fun to make. But I also want to include all of you in this new series from the get-go. Not only will I be posting some polls to help see what fights you'd like to see looked at, but I'd also like to pick suggestions from the comments and shout out whoever picked the winning fight, much like with our Bleach the Best Scene series. To begin with, however, I wanted to evaluate a showdown between two of Bleach's absolute undisputed titans. Two figureheads of the afterlife, two capstones of Soul Society history, two ancient leaders of the Shinigami. And a matchup that's been requested probably more than anything else on the channel as far as these kind of matchup videos went. The founder of the Gotei 13 and the first Captain Commander Shigakuni Genryusai Yamamoto versus the leader of the Zero Division and the monk who calls the true name. Ichibei Hyosube. This is going to be a brutal smackdown of the most incredible proportions, so let's dive into it. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support me and the channel. And if you want to take that support from me another step further, I do have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to say a massive shout out and a huge thank you to everyone supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate it. And another shout out and a huge thank you goes out to everyone who has checked out my second channel, Mr. Tomo Talks Games. If you want to go over there, check out some of the videos, maybe leave a subscribe, I really would appreciate that as well. So thank you to each and every one of you. And of course, there will also be some spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc in this video to come. So of course, this video being the first one in the series, it is something of a work in progress. So please do leave me some feedback down in the comments below about what you liked about the video, maybe what you change for future installments. My current thinking is that we're going to do a brief overview of the fight to come, then do a detailed look at the individual combatants before taking a look at how a potential fight between them may actually play out before coming to a definitive conclusion on who the winner would be by the time we get to the outcome. And so then beginning with our brief overview, when does Deciding the winner of a potential bout like this, there's a lot we need to consider. Yamamoto has had considerably more face time in the source material with the audience than Ichibei, but there's far more to it than just that. We'll also be taking into account absolutely everything we've seen from each character and how that's affected their own fights within the series. We'll also be taking into account what they've displayed of their intelligence, their versatility, their intuition, their tenacity, and more. And of course, their battle prowess their Zanpak Toe and other masteries over the Shinigami arts. Now, luckily for us, this is a good starting point because when it comes down to both of these characters on show, we have a pretty solid understanding of what each of them can bring to the table. So, speaking of which, without further ado, let's take a look at the individual combatants. As the founder of the Gotei 13 and one of the most ancient Shinigami we've ever met in the series, Yamamoto has long been depicted as the absolute pinnacle of power in Bleach. Before the Thousand Year Blood War arc, it was fairly clear, at least in my opinion, that no single opponent was really capable of standing up to him. Aizen himself even believed that in a 1v1 battle against Yamamoto, he would probably lose. And I think that's pretty clear-cut. 
Kubo wanted Yamamoto to be not only the archetypal Shinigami, but also to show him in visuals, in legacy and prowess as the leader bearing the weight of a millennia of Soul Society history and tradition on his shoulders. Of course, once characters like Ichigo and Aizen began transcending, Yamamoto was getting left behind. But as far as purely Shinigami characters went, Yamamoto was nigh undefeatable without some kind of trickery. I do feel like some sections of the community have a tendency to underrate Yamamoto a little these days. It's certainly true that with the advent of the Thousand Year Blood War arc and the impossibly powerful characters that came with it, both Shinigami and Quincy, there's no escaping the sheer fact that the average power level of characters in this arc skyrockets, with popular and familiar characters like Ichigo, Zaraki, Byakia and Hitsugaya becoming exponentially stronger than they were before. But with as ancient and as wise as he is, Yamamoto has almost certainly seen virtually everything this world has to offer and fought in the bloodiest and most brutal battles of its history, and was very confident in his belief that no Shinigami has been born stronger than him in the last thousand years. And when it comes to Yamamoto and speaking on his own abilities, I think he's very much akin to Aizen in that way, that he's so powerful he has no need to artificially inflate his own strength through some kind of misplaced ego, so when he says something like that, I'm inclined to believe it. Not only that, but in the brief snippets we did get to see Yamamoto in action during the source material, Kubo took the time to explicitly show us how much he excelled in every area of Shinigami combat. Whether it was his overwhelming Shikai Ryujin Jaka, a monstrous elemental force of pure destruction, which was overbearing enough to cause the combined duo of Kyoraku and Okitake, also in Shikai, to tremble in its wake, as well as obliterating a plethora of characters in one hit, from all three of the Trey Bestia to the Sternritter Driscoll Bursi, to his mastery of Hakuda hand to hand combat. The entire point of Yamamoto's battle against Wonderweiss was so Kubo could show us that Yamamoto isn't just a one trick pony, and that even without access to his Zanpakuto, he's a near unstoppable force. Using just his bare hands and his centuries of fighting experience, he completely tears Wonderweiss apart, with a single Ikots punch bursting a hole in the Iran car before going on to shatter his body completely with Sokots. In terms of his physical prowess, then, Yamamoto Yamamoto is clearly depicted as being second to none, proving himself also nearly unmatched in Shunpo as well when he arrived at the site of his battle against Kyoraku and Okitake long before they did. Then there's Kido. Again, while not used much, a severely injured Yamamoto activates Hado 96 without even so much as an incantation, even going so far as to sacrifice his own arm to use it. But there's even more to Yamamoto than that. While he might be stubborn and unmoving, his many, many years of experience have left him incredibly well-versed in the art of battle, as you might expect, and of understanding his foes. While barely even moving to avoid ion strikes, he scolds the beast on being a creature that exists only to kill, and also notes that Wonderweiss clearly has been modified when he attacks without any kind of a preliminary indication though Yamamoto is still fast enough to avoid it easily. So I think it would be wise to not underestimate how perceptive Yamamoto can be. He's more than just a blunt instrument, and has clearly shown a willingness to put it all on the line to hinder his enemy. And all of this comes without even touching on the nigh unfathomable power of his Bankai Zanka no Tachi, which we were fortunate enough to witness in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Thanks to its four distinct abilities, of which both East and West seem to activate upon activation, of the Bankai itself, Zanka no Tachi presents Yamamoto with a substantial upgrade over even Ryujin Jaka. Where Ryujin Jaka's flames torched enemies to ash, Zanka no Tachi simply removes them from existence. His Shikai was a spectacle already, a showcase in the ultimate offensive power, but his Bankai is that and more, with the inclusion of the ultimate shield as well. A swing of east is enough to wipe landmarks off the map, while Zanka no Tachi West may prove to be the most crucial of all of Yamamoto's litany of abilities in this battle to come. Cloaking Yamamoto in such intense Ryatsu as to form a billowing armour of flames, and anything that comes near him is disintegrated completely. 
Throw an army of charred, untiring skeletons and an all-consuming wave of fire into the mix, and Zanka no Tachi might just be the most incredible Bankai we ever saw. Yamamoto being killed a mere 30 or so chapters into an arc that's over 200 chapters long is what I think has led people to discredit him somewhat. But the truth is, both Aizen and Yuhabak felt the need to employ some form of deception in order to secure a win, rather than face the former head captain themselves. That says a lot to me. Yuhabak may kill Yamamoto in essentially one hit, but Yamamoto was clearly ready to continue fighting once his true enemy revealed himself. Had his Bankai not been stolen in that moment, delivering the ultimate blow to Yamamoto's morale, I think this pre-almighty version of Yuhabak would have been in real trouble. Yamamoto's death seems to come mostly as a result of him choosing to give up in that moment. The anime even lends further credence to this when a tired, worn-down Yamamoto lowers his blade to the ground in an acceptance of defeat mostly it seems due to circumstance. So it's clear to me, at least, that Yamamoto is incredibly powerful, versatile, and immensely capable in almost every facet of combat. With over a thousand years of experience to back him up, and a Shikai and Bankai that represent the ultimate in both offensive and defensive capability, it seems likely then that his opponent doesn't stand a chance. Right? And this is where things get tricky. As I mentioned, we have a lot less to go on where the ever-mysterious Ichibei is concerned. With an ancient connection to the Soul King himself, and being a steadfast, devout defender of the palace, Soul Society's most sacred ground, as the leader of the Zero Division, Ichibei is the de facto commander of all Soul Society forces. Not only that, but even Yamamoto must be a whippersnapper in the eyes of Ichibei, not that you'd know it by looking at them, but Ichibei appears to be a strange, otherworldly being who goes so far as to barely feel like a Shinigami at all, certainly at least in the traditional sense. Yamamoto may claim that no Shinigami born in the last 1000 years is stronger than him, and that may be true, but Ichibei is definitely older than that, and I think considerably so. In many ways, Ichibei feels like the progenitor of all Shinigami, much in the same way as Yuhabak is where the Quincy themselves began, or at least the race of Quincy in the way that we know them to be in the modern day. And interestingly, that is not where Ichibei's comparisons to Yuhabak will end in this video. Ichibei is responsible for naming everything in the world of the Soul Society, from Zanpak To to Shikai and Ba. Bankai itself. Not only that, but as part of his role as the monk who calls the true name, the Soul King saw fit to bestow upon him the greatest responsibility of all, power and knowledge over names themselves. Let's talk about names for a moment, as their importance and their prominence are at the core of what makes Ichibei such a terrifying monster. In the universe of Bleach, names contain power. After all, ever since the very beginning, Shinigami have been calling the name of their Zanpakuto in order to draw out its true strength. Names are central to Ichibei's own strength, and his command over them is akin to that of a god. Imagine being a Shinigami, and growing and facilitating a unique personal bond with your Zanpakuto. Then realising, after potentially hundreds of years spent in partnership with this Zanpakuto, that this strange, ethereal monk has known your Zanpakuto's true name all this time, but even worse, potentially knows it better than you do. That's like saying Ichibei has a window into every soul and every Shinigami, and a way of communicating with the deepest recesses of their soul, the truest nature of their Zanpakuto, their partner. This is just one of the many ways that Ichibei comes across as a divine figure in the world of Bleach. He warns Yuhabak not to speak his name in vain, but when Yuhabak carelessly does so anyway, he completely loses his voice, as though he's not even worthy to have it. Not only that, but in battle, Ichibei has the power to rob his opponent of their own strength. As we see in his battle against Yuhabak, the sealed form of his Zanpakuto, taking the shape of a hefty calligraphy brush, can split the power of Yuhabak's limbs by cutting into their names. It's easy to conceptualise when you consider the Japanese characters used. At its core, the name of something is the source of its power, and that goes for all things, not just Zanpakuto. 
But Ichibe has the power to split and break those names, reducing that power however he sees fit. By simply landing a hit on Yuhabak, Ichibe splits his name in half, and in doing so, reduces his overall strength by half as well. It's a completely unprecedented power, but one fitting for such a venerated figure among the Shinigami. Although we're unfortunately only treated to one fight for Ichibe in the series, it's a real showstopper, and Kubo lets loose, unleashing two of his most omnipotent forces against each other in an all-out explosive duel. Once Ichibe Shikai Ichimonji is revealed, the stakes are raised again. Now, rather than simply cutting names in half, Ichibe splashes ink everywhere with each swing, and everything the ink touches completely loses its name. The example we get to see is when Yuhabak no longer knows the name of his own sword, and then later Yuhabak himself is coated in black ink, losing his name altogether. But imagine this power being used against a Shinigami. We go back to this idea of having a partner you've spent your entire life with, only to have their name and essentially their essence stripped away in an instant. As easy as Ichibe flicking his wrist. All that power, that bond, presumably vanishes. That's what makes Ichibe truly scary. It's as though he chooses to give you power, and if he so wishes, he can take it all back again in an instant. And again, there's that frighteningly similar comparison to Yuhabak. But that's also really only one aspect of Ichimonji's power. Thanks to his Shikai, Ichibe controls all the black in the world. The colour black is his to harness and do with as he pleases, with seemingly no limit. He steals it away from both Shinigami and Quincy as they lie dead on the battlefield far, far below, as well as Yuhabak himself, feeding his own strength, his blade's power, and he can seemingly do so with, as I said, no restrictions, from potentially hundreds to thousands of miles away. We see him from the royal palace stealing the black from the body of a newt way out beyond the Seireite itself. It's truly an incredible unmatched power. And presumably, as long as Yamamoto is wearing his Shihaku show, his Gote 13 uniform, he'll always have a source of power, a well, from Ichibe to draw from. His Bankai Shirafude Ichimonji is so ancient it heralds from a time before the word Bankai was even being used. It was known as the first Shinuchi, the first ever evolved Zan Park Toe, which tells you an awful lot about how old Ichibe may actually be. But this Bankai complements his Shikai rather than expanding on it. Where Ichimonji can remove names, Shirafude Ichimonji allows Ichibe to play God even further, rewriting his target's name and giving them all the properties that come with it. But even without his Zan Park Toe's incredible powers, Ichibe is shown in just this one fight to be a master of all other schools of teaching, much like Yamamoto. He's fast enough to appear directly behind Yuhabak even after the latter was flung across the sky, and he's physically strong enough to send Yuhabak soaring back towards the palace with a simple strike of his weapon, and even more amazingly, force Yuhabak's invasive blood out of his own veins with sheer might, sending it back into his enemy and bursting out of his face in a very awesome scene. When it comes to Kido mastery, Ichibe unleashes a secret or forbidden Kido against Yuhabak without so much as an incantation, as well as constantly summoning apparitions of presumably his own body parts to buffet Yuhabak and send him careening across the arena. And so before we look at the fight itself, let's return to this notion of Ichibe being divine. The ultimate power of his Zanpak To, Futen Taisat Suryo, steals blackness from the very night sky itself, robbing the Soul Society of nights to come in the future, in order to send Yuhabak into a pitch black hell, from which even reincarnation is supposedly impossible. It's a shame this ability ends up being simply hand waved away, because based on what Ichibe is saying, We've never seen anything like this in Bleach before, a power that holds direct influence over the cycle of life and death, which is of course intrinsic to Bleach itself. So after all that, while it seems Yamamoto might be the apex of what a Shinigami can achieve, Ichibe may in fact be something more than a Shinigami altogether, something closer to a god. 
But regardless, let's take a look at a potential battle between the two of them. When it comes to the fight, Yamamoto and Ichibe face each other down. It's difficult to imagine what the Reiatsu is like in the air in that moment. Ichibe, after all, spends his time in the suffocating, crushing Reiatsu of his palace, so the sky around them would be thick with a power so great, it's hard to believe anyone could really function in their vicinity. There's one last thing to take into account. What state of mind are these characters actually in? Ichibe has shown to be almost inhumanly ambivalent. Having loomed over everything and everyone for so many eons, he's grown distant from the plights of regular beings and become almost completely robotically detached. That being said, there's an arrogance to Ichibe that borders on complacency, and we see, even when faced with Yuhabark's almighty that would eventually be his undoing, he foolishly thinks there's no way he could possibly lose. Meanwhile, Yamamoto has, for the most part, been a stoic, statuesque foundation throughout the entirety of Bleach, but both his emotions and his beliefs can easily get the better of him, as we've seen. Particularly in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, when Chojiro is killed, Yamamoto spirals out of control greatly, returning to his rage-filled self, albeit his more dangerous self, from a thousand years ago. He's a very different fighter there than he is at any point against Aizen, where he comes across considerably more composed, even after being seriously wounded, he never falls back into that vat of anger. While I don't see Ichibe giving Yamamoto any reason to tap into that raw, passionate rage, I think Yamamoto wouldn't underestimate the leader of the Zero Division at all. Now, if we assume that both fighters are masters of the four Shinigami combat arts, which it certainly seems like they are, then really, honestly, Kido, Hoho, and Hakuda are almost non-entities here. There's a ceiling to how effectively you can use those abilities, and both fighters have proven themselves to have exceptional prowess in all of them. Admittedly, we don't really know what the secret or forbidden Kido that Ichibe uses actually entails. Is it stronger, more destructive than Yamamoto's incantationless Hardo 96? Interestingly, the secret Kido shattered Yuhabak's Bloop Vein and Haban, which was said to expand the defensive capabilities of Bloop Vein outside the body. The same Bloop Vein, mind you, that was keeping Roid Lloyd from turning to ash from Yamamoto's Bankai earlier in the arc. Immediately, though, I think Yamamoto has multiple variables to be wary of when the battle begins. I don't want to downplay our former head captain, but at the end of the day, for as monstrous as he is, and this feels ludicrous to say, he is just a Shinigami. As a member of the Zero Division, Ichibe has been bestowed a number of strange, almost occult powers. For example, if Yamamoto were to speak Ichibe's name out of turn and has his throat destroyed, he can no longer call out any abilities. And unlike Yu Habak, he presumably would have no way of restoring his voice until after the fight, when either the 4th or the 12th Division could come to his aid. Now, this wouldn't be the end of the world, as someone who has achieved Bankai can summon their Shikai without calling out its name, but it would at least presumably limit somewhat of what Yamamoto could actually achieve. The version of Yuha Bark that does battle with Ichibe, at least until he activates the Almighty, is the same one who takes on Ichigo briefly at the end of the first invasion. So to be honest, I think it's feasible that Yamamoto can hold his own in a straight fight with Ichibe as the two of them lock weapons. Of course, in their base forms, Yamamoto's Ryujin Jaka has no special properties until he activates Shikai, while Ichibe has the power to cut names in half even now. Even slightly touching Ichimonji with his arm would result in Yamamoto's arm strength being drastically reduced. Interestingly, I think knowing that means Yamamoto would prefer to approach the fight from a distance. Activating Ryujin Jaka gives him access to abilities that can cover the expanse of an entire city, such as Enetsu Jigoku, or from a distance he may even be capable of sealing Ichibe inside his fiery prison, Jokaku Enjo. Jokaku Enjo has always been a weird one to me. Were Aizen, Gin, and Tosun totally incapable of escaping their cage, or did they simply decide to sit back and wait for an opportune moment? 
Considering who Lear itself came as reinforcements and saved them, I tend to think it might actually be the former. Regardless, even if Yamamoto sealed Ichibei inside the Castle of Flames, it's only buying himself precious time. He's going to have to face him at some point. But there's another point to consider as well. In order to remove Ryujin Jaka's name, does Ichibei need to splash the sword itself with ink, the actual blade, any part of the blade, or just its flames? If he only needs to cover the flames with ink, then I think the battle is essentially over before it even begins. However, personally, I think that's unlikely, and therefore Ichibei needs to get in close as quickly as he can to avoid being surrounded by Ryujin Jaka's all-encompassing power. So we've got Yamamoto, who wants to keep Ichibei as far away as possible, and Ichibei, who wants Yamamoto within range of his ink as quickly as he can. Between the two of them, I think Yamamoto Shikai is the more versatile versatile, allowing him to control the battle easier if he remains out of Ichibei's reach. But Ichibei Shikai has a singular ability that's technically more powerful, more broken than anything Yamamoto can do, raw strength be damned. I imagine that if Ichibei got too close to Yamamoto using that incredible speed of his, or after attempting to bind the former head captain with a powerful Kido, Yamamoto would, on the fly, be able to switch to Hakuda in an attempt to keep the leader of the Zero Division at bay. So while these two fighters may continue to trade blows and evade one another, in my opinion the outcome of the fight comes down to actually one major factor. When? does Yamamoto activate his Bankai? Simply put, I think the only way Yamamoto overcomes Ichibei and his abilities and wins the fight is if he activates Bankai almost immediately. Once Yamamoto has managed to escape Ichibei's range and can be sure he won't be hit by any ink in the moment of activation, he releases Zanka no Tachi. Now, Yamamoto isn't consumed by rage here like he is against Roid Lloyd, but this is going back to the idea that he wouldn't underestimate the leader of the Zero Division. And Ichibei feels the effects immediately. Zanka no Tachi's activation heats up the battlefield and begins to dry out the area. As we saw in the source material, even Daigurin Hyorin Maru being nowhere near Zanka no Tachi becomes totally useless in the face of this power. So how would it affect Ichibei and his Zanpak Toe, if at all? Well, you see, I think this is a potentially interesting one. Ichimonji Shikai is focused on splashing ink on everything from the tip of its combined blade brush. But if Zanka no Tachi was activated, would the ink simply dry up? A dried up brush is virtually unusable, it's virtually useless unless soaked in water again, and Zanka no Tachi removes all moisture from the atmosphere and continues to intensify the longer it's being used. But that's not the only issue Ichibei faces either. As seen in his battle with Royd, Yamamoto's Zanka no Tachi West ability activates immediately along with his Bankai, he just chooses to make it visible or not. That gives him an immensely effective shield, which incinerates everything in its vicinity to nothing, very similar perhaps in execution to how Aizen's own Reiatsu functions in his post-transcendent state. So Zanka no Tachi West seemingly totally negates Ichibei's advantage up close. It's likely his Zanpak Toe would be destroyed in the exact same way Royd's blade was, should he try to strike at Yamamoto directly. If Ichibei tries to splash ink on Yamamoto, it's also likely as well, I think, the ink would probably evaporate before even coming into contact. However, there is one potential element that we need to consider, and that's that I don't think Zanka no Tachi West is totally infallible after all. As we can see from several shots from the battle against Royd, Yamamoto's arm and his blade are totally exposed, seemingly at all times. Whether they're protected by the Shield of West or not is unclear. We only see it protect Yamamoto's body, the area where the flames cover. So if Ichibei was able to withstand Yamamoto's immense heat, the very force of the sun, long enough to lock blades with him and splash ink on the exposed sword itself, 
then it seems likely that Yamamoto's Bankai would be immediately diminished, stripping his Zanpakuto of its name and its power. Of course, if Yamamoto doesn't activate Zanka no Tachi in time, and finds himself even brushing up against the base form of Ichimonji, or covered in ink by the Shikai version of Ichimonji, I think the fight is basically over from that point. Meaning, really, this fight is in Ichibei's favour, in almost every way, from almost every angle, if he's able to defeat Yamamoto with basically his Shikai, or even potentially the base form of his Zanpakuto, where Yamamoto has to exert nearly everything to secure a win, I do think it's looking likely that this fight's going to Ichibei. So essentially, in order to win, Yamamoto has to activate Bankai immediately before being hit by any ink but then also kill Ichibei as quickly as possible and without putting his sword in a position of risk. Using Zanka no Tachi South to summon an army of skeletons is another good method for keeping Ichibei at bay, though he wouldn't suffer the same emotional effect that Roid Lloyd did and would likely just obliterate the army as fast as possible. So again, it looks likely, to me at least anyway, that Ichibei would be one of the few characters capable of exposing a possible chink in Yamamoto's seemingly impenetrable armour. And so, looking at the outcome, at the end of the fight, I think Ichibei Hyosabe, leader of the Zero Division, is likely to emerge the winner in almost every scenario. His abilities, while I don't think they're as versatile as those of the former head captains, are simply too overpowered, they're too broken, they're too all-encompassing. The power of names is too integral to every Shinigami, and having all the abilities of their Zanpakuto locked down would be too detrimental. The fact that Ichibei has access to changing names like that, to removing them, pretty much gives him access to the kryptonite of virtually any Shinigami opponent he might come up against. Admittedly, Yamamoto has proven before that losing Ryujin Jaka isn't the end, but against an opponent who not only still has their Zanpakuto, but is also at least as skilled as the former head captain is in every other combat art, means Yamamoto would be in serious trouble were Ryujin Jaka to be shut down. Ichibei isn't Wonderwise after all. Ichibei was seen completely overpowering Yuhabak, tossing him around like a ragdoll before he activated the Almighty, using a variety of powers and strengths, not just his Zanpakuto. Honestly though, both of these characters have shown that they are capable of using the power of their Zanpakuto to its greatest advantage, but in tandem with a plethora of other Shinigami abilities. Kido, Hakada, Hoho, all of that is used to create the ultimate fighting capability. It seems to me at the end that the only way Yamamoto realises he can overpower Ichibei and his Zanpakuto is to use Bankai, and almost straight away before any ink can be flung. But but even then, it seems like there is potentially a way for Ichibei to totally undo his Bankai altogether if he directly targets Yamamoto's exposed arm and blade. If that doesn't work, then I definitely think this does become a slightly more difficult fight, unless, of course, Ichibei's ink does still work regardless of Zanka no Tachi West. Then there's the fact that using his Bankai seems to at least be somewhat taxing on Yamamoto, as Yuhabak himself speculates, so perhaps Ichibei could simply try and outlast Yamamoto and then finish him off. Also, the great irony of this matchup as well is that if Yamamoto does somehow pull it off and manage to kill Ichibei, he can simply be revived as long as the Soul King's palace is still standing and someone simply calls his name. Whereas if Yamamoto dies, he is not coming back. While I think this would be a real spectacle of a fight, and both combatants would be able to do battle until the bitter end, fighting tooth and nail with all their amazing powers on display, I have to give this one to the leader of the Zero Division when it comes down to the wire. Ichibei can do everything that Yamamoto can, but with the addition of ancient and mysterious powers, the likes of which no regular Shinigami has, as well as a Zanpakuto that feels literally divine within the world of Bleach. Where all Shinigami, all Aranka, even the Fullbringers and the Quincy's rely on names to unlock their true power, their true strength, the one who controls names, controls everything, and everyone.
All right, guys, but that's it for the video, the first one in our Bleach versus Battle series. I really hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below, of course, your thoughts on the verdict, the outcome of the battle between Yamamoto and Ichibei. I'd love to hear if you think I'm right on this one, if you think I'm wrong. Let me know your reasoning for both. And of course, let me know which fight you'd like to see next, and I'll pick one of them and shout out whoever was the winner. I really do hope you enjoyed it. Let me know, of course, the feedback on the format and everything like that. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thoughts. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Check out Mr. Tomo Talks Games as well. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.